Hello AP World students, Mr. Rich, coming to you from my house. I was going to do these at school. I did my AP European ones on Monday morning, and then we were told we had to leave and we couldn't stay at school. So here I am. You get a picture of stately Rich Manor sitting in my recliner talking to all of you. So this first lecture is going to be about China. So China in period four, 1900 to present. So get your notebooks out. Let's run through some big picture ideas. If you have any questions about anything I talk about, you're welcome to either send me an email or to respond in the stream uh, on Google Classroom. I'll be glad to get back to you over the next couple days. So we start China when we left off in 1900. China was in a very bad shape. China had just undergone what's called the Boxer Rebellion in which a society of Chinese folks that hate foreigners had risen up and we're trying to get rid of foreign intervention in the country. Now that not only includes Europeans and Americans and whatnot, that also includes the Qing Dynasty, who's ruled China since 1644, but came from Manchuria, which at that time was not a part of China. So they're considered foreigners as well. And so this rebellion is raging as we start time period four, and we actually, ironically enough, for a rebellion that started by people that hate foreigners, it is put down by asking foreigners for assistance. So it's not a question really in 1900 of if the Qing Dynasty is gonna collapse, it's rather when is it gonna collapse. In 1905 in China, we stopped giving the civil service exam, which has been given at this point for almost 2,000 years. If you remember, that's the test where we decide who is worthy of becoming a government employee in China. The logic is that if you study hard and work very well, you will then be an excellent employee who has great virtue and value, and you will be unlikely to cheat or um, take bribes or anything like that. So that's kind of where we are. That's the logic of it, and that's the thought. So this is all heading towards in 1911, the Qing Dynasty, again since 1644, will be overthrown in a coup. Now, the last emperor of China, you think this 3,500 years of imperial history and all these great emperors and big palaces and successful wars, the last emperor of imperial China is a six-year-old boy. His name is Pu Yi. He goes on to have a really interesting life. He will be put in as the puppet state ruler of China during World War II when the Japanese control the state and lives really a fascinating life. So I'd encourage you, if you have any interest, to look up more information about Emperor Pu Yi. But uh, at this point, China is now going to be a republic. Now, if you remember, the definition of the word republic politically is that people get to vote. Not a majority, that'd be a democracy, but some people in China get to vote. This is very minimal, but there is certainly a chance in the early 20th century that China would become a liberal, liberal democracy. Of course, we know that does not happen. Now, China is not industrialized. They're still not industrialized in 1911, so there's a lot of problems. Also, the nationalists really don't, the Republicans, excuse me, really don't have a plan. They just kind of take over and they're like, yes, we're in charge of the capital. And then the question is, what do we do next? And China basically devolves into a system almost very similar to many towns in the American West in the 19th century. You got a sheriff and you got a bunch of bad guys and the bad guys have more weapons than the sheriff does. So China's ruled by a series of warlords which basically is a literal term. There are lords of war. They're basically gangsters. They're in charge of this city or that city. Now, if you were to look at a map of China in 1915, you'll see that it says China, and it's got a big map, and it looks kind of like modern China. But in reality, China is run by local warlords, gangsters, who kind of sort of do what they want, and life is not very good for the Chinese folks. Now, during World War I, the Chinese decide to side with the Allies, the British and the French, later the Americans, because the Germans had taken some land in China as part of their territorial expansion. So the thought is, for the Chinese, if we help the Allies and they defeat the Germans, we'll get that land back, and then we'll form a relationship. These guys can help us um, with some of our problems. They can give us some much-needed money. They can help us industrialize, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the plan. And they send soldiers over to Europe, and they do, in fact, help fight in World War I. Of course, what happens when the Treaty of Versailles comes out in 1919 that land is not given to China. That land is given to Japan, who also is on Team Ally during the war. So, so this crushes the Chinese and angers a lot of them. Now, the Treaty of Versailles comes, on, comes out on May the 4th, 1919. So we actually have what is called the May 4th Movement. And the May 4th Movement in China is the creation of the Chinese Communist Party. And the Chinese Communist Party in the 1920s will come to be led by a young man named Mao Zedong. 
Mao, like many other communists, is the son of a wealthy landowner. And he is frustrated by his father's wealth. He feels like his dad does not treat the peasants uh, terribly well and dislikes his father and actually leaves home frustrated and angry, going out into the world to eventually create a communist society in his homeland. Now, Chinese communism is going to be created just two years after the Russian Revolution. So we're copying a lot from Lenin. We, again, do not have an industrial factory worker base like Marx talked about. So therefore, the base of the Chinese Communist Party will be peasants, farmers, millions and millions and millions of them. Much like Lenin says, the middle class are good guys and we will help lead the revolution. Mao says the same thing. I and my compatriots will lead the revolution. We will help the average person. We will allow them to, because we have some education, we can lead the revolution in their name. Now, the other group of people that are vying for control of China are called the nationalists. Now, the name of the leader of the nationalists for multiple decades is a guy named Chiang Kai-shek. That's a name that if you're trying to get a five might be really beneficial. If you're just thinking, let's just pass this sucker, I would not worry about Mr. Mr. Chang and his name. Uh, one thing to know about Chinese names, Chinese like several languages, instead of reading uh, left to right, it reads right to left. So they don't change the way they write things just because it's how we do things. So if you were talking in a Western parlance, it would be Zedong Mao or Kaishek Chang. So when I call him Mao or Chang, I'm referring to their last names, even though to us it looks like a first name. So understand the naming conventions of Chinese are a little different, and that's why. You also sometimes see uh, Zedong spelled T-S-E-T-U-N-G, Zedong, because remember, Chinese has a different alphabet, and so we're not translating, we're transliterating. They have different sounds that we don't have, and vice versa. So the spelling may be slightly different, like Taoism can be with a D or a T, something we talked about a long time ago. So anyway, Mao is going to be the leader of the communist. They are a small group of people. The, the majority party for the 1920s and the 30s is going to be the nationalists. Now, the nationalists are your traditional elites. They're the landowners. They're the business owners. They are your traditional, powerful Chinese people who have shifted their loyalty from the dynasty of the emperor to the nationalists. And they're supportive of the nationalists because we don't have warlords anymore. We've taken control of that system. And so business is flowing, life's pretty good, everything's fine. But of course, the vast majority of Chinese people are peasants. And Mao will look to the support of the peasants. Because, just like the Soviet Union, or excuse me, just like uh, Karl Marx talks about, Mao wants to redistribute the land from the rich to the poor. He wants to take the land from rich people and give it to poor people. And that would allow the poverty-stricken folks of rural China to have a... Um, government have some land for themselves and that's very exciting to them and that's what they're looking for. So anyway, that's what we're looking at right now. Now, in the 1930s, the nationalists are in charge of China. China has a very rough decade. As you may remember, when we looked at World War II, the Japanese invade in 1931 into Manchuria. They extend their inv invasion of more of China in 1937 and they rule China for the 1930s and into 1945. The Japanese do horrible things in China. That We watched that video on Unit 731. They commit horrible, atrocious acts. China is also affected negatively by the Great Depression, not because they have a large industrial base or a stock market, but because they trade with some of the nations that are hurt, and so the demand for Chinese goods diminishes, and China is going to suffer. So it's a, to say it's a rough start to the 20th century for China is an understatement. We had a bad 19th century. We're going to have a bad first three quarters of the 20th century. So China is really, really, really struggling both economically and politically. Now at the end of World War II, of course the Japanese are defeated primarily by the United States and therefore China is freed from that foreign invasion. What then occurs is Mao decides since the nationalists are weak and the nationalists are also unpopular because they were the ones who allowed the Japanese to come in and dominate. This is the time for the communists to strike and we have a civil war much like in Russia, we have a civil war after World War I. In China, we have a civil war after World War II. And the communist versus nationalist, this time part two. However, Mao has increased his support. Millions and millions of peasants support him. Mao is also supporting women's rights. 
and says that we should end the traditional Chinese practice of foot binding, which has been around at this point for almost 800 years, uh, diminishing women's literal ability to walk, which would mean they can't work from home. So Mao's not a great feminist or anything who believes women are equal. Mao would like to see for China's industrial capacity, we need half of our workforce to be able to walk out of the house and into a factory. So Mao also promises to end that practice for women. Uh, Mao also has a guerrilla army. They use non-traditional battle techniques, etc., etc. Long story short, in 1949, China becomes communist. Now, at this point, Mao is the leader of China. Mao is going to copy a lot of his ideology from Stalin. Again, we don't know, back in 1949, the awful things Stalin did to his own people in the 1930s. We don't know about the purges and the show trials and um, the paranoia and the killing of millions of people from starvation because we want to look cool during the Great Depression. None of that is public knowledge yet. Because Stalin's an excellent dictator, he suppresses that knowledge for the world to know. So Mao's like, cool, I want to copy Stalin because Stalin has the same ideology as me and Stalin's awesome. Of course, later on we know that is in fact wrong. But at this point, we will see the Chinese undertake a lot of the same reforms and much like the Soviet Union, most of those reforms will be unsuccessful. All right, so that's where we are. Let's talk about a couple of those reforms that Mao undertakes. The first one is called the Great Leap Forward sometimes derisively called the Great Leap Backward because it's an attempt to industrialize China and it fails woefully. It's 1958. We are going to try to follow some of those Stalinist ideas. So we're going to have central economic planning. We're going to have five-year plans just like the Russians. We're going to try to focus on industrialization. Now, the Russians are able to get everything focused on the big stuff, tanks and railroads and you know space eventually and all those kind of things. Mao has some really unusual ideas. He says, for example, the way to make steel, which is the essential component of industrial capacity, is we're going to ask people to build little furnaces in their homes or backyards, and each person is going to contribute a little piece of steel to their community, and we're going to bring that together in a common location and melt it down and put it all together. Now, I don't know if you know anything about steel. Steel, it takes hundreds and hundreds of degrees of Celsius to melt. It is not something the average person can do. It's incredibly unsafe. It's also inefficient to have random peasants with no education trying to make steel. It's just dumb, and it doesn't work. Mao will also, much like Stalin, institute the collectivized farm system where we're going to take private land and we're going to take it as government-owned property. And instead of having a 1,000 one-acre farms, we're going to have one 1,000-acre farm. And suppose efficiency that was going to happen in the Soviet Union will also supposedly happen here. Once again, we take away motivation. Why would I work hard? How do I get any benefit from this? If we make extra food, what does it help me, the average peasant? How do I improve my lifestyle? Blah, 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 blah. Those things are going to be the same problems we saw in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. So we'll have a famine. Now, again, we still don't know the exact details because China is still a dictatorship. They still don't like to talk about their failures. So we don't know. What we know about Stalin's time is because after the Soviet Union collapsed, foreign scholars were allowed to go in and do research on Soviet history and policy. That is yet to happen in China because it's still a dictatorship. So best guess, because China's population density, etc., some scholars say up to 60 million people probably starved to death during the Great Leap Forward and afterward due to falling agricultural production. 60 million people. That's as many people as die in World War II. Just horrendous, awful, awful things. So Mao is actually going to be benched for a while. He gets sent down to the minor leagues. He is not going to be the leader of China. Now, if you go to look at Wikipedia, you will see things like Mao rules from 1949 to 1976. Yeah, I remember this is not a democracy. There's no election. There's no official process. You get to be the ruler because you're most dominant because you flex on everybody. And so Mao kind of gets sent to the sidelines for a bit, even though if you look on Wikipedia, it will say he's the ruler. Now, a couple years later, he is going to uh, emerge. And China has improved its economy a little bit. Uh, things are doing okay. We've started to have industrialization in China. So there are some benefits. Uh, Mao is also known for some of his policies to the minorities in China. For example, Tibet, a nation of people who are mostly Buddhist, who believe their leader, the Dalai Lama, has been reincarnated and is their spiritual advisor. Tibet is conquered by the Chinese. The Dalai Lama is forced into exile. And the Dalai Lama is currently, um, he's in his late 70s, he is the 14th version of the Dalai Lama. 
And when he passes, it is believed a child will uh, inherit his soul. In a couple years, they'll be able to tell who that is. China seriously passed a law a couple years ago dictating that any reincarnation must be approved by the government. They're just saying that's a ridiculous law. How do they in, how do they ensure that's true? That's just to control who the 15th Dalai Lama will be. Because for much of the last 50 years, the Dalai Lama has been an international advocate for peace, traveling the world. He came to Louisville a couple years ago. He attended a uh, service at the Buddhist monastery in Hubbard's Lane, not five minutes from Ballard High School. And he has been an advocate for the support of Tibetan independence and autonomy. And he's kind of a thorn in the Chinese side, and so they're looking to replace him whenever he does pass with their own candidate, which will be a very interesting process. Now, Mao's going to come back for a second time for his attempt to fix the Chinese economy and society, and it's called the Cultural Revolution. It begins in 1976, and it will last until Mao's death in 1976. Now, Mao this time is going to try something completely different. China is a society still based on Confucianism, so respect for elders, traditional rights, um, you know, there's rule and order and structure. Mao says none of that stuff's worked. Clearly, that's why we have struggled. And so we're going to try new stuff. We're going to encourage rebellion. We're going to encourage us to overthrow traditional beliefs and structures in society. And one of the ways we're going to do this is we're going to discourage intellectuals because smart people, well, the problem is they think they're smart and they think they know what they're doing, and they think they have the best advice for everything, and so therefore they're always getting in the way. So what we really need is a revolution of the proletariat, of the worker, of the average person. The average person in China is not highly educated. They probably don't have any education, frankly. So we're going to turn society over to them. If you're a doctor, if you're an engineer, if you're a person of high status, a professor perhaps, a teacher, we're going to send you to the countryside for some re-education. We're going to let you plant rice for a while. You know what? That'll teach you what real life is all about. That'll make you a better person. And that'll humble you because your exalted status is really what has caused China trouble over the years. You know what we definitely don't need? Schools. So in the big cities where there's a lot of most kids are in school, that doesn't need to happen. What we need to do is let the revolution live through our children. So we're going to close the schools down. And we're going to put the power of the revolution in the hands of like 12-year-old kids. And they're going to roam the streets. And they're going to be looking for anybody who is not down with the new idea. So if somebody is performing a Taoist ritual. Oh, no, 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 no. We don't do Taoism. It's old-fashioned. It's 2,500 years old. It has no purpose in 20th century China. So we're actually going to allow those kids to basically beat up that person. And they can just you know beat, take their stuff beat them up with no repercussions whatsoever. It's an insane system, truly insane. But once again, other societies will copy it. We'll talk about that in a minute, or in another lecture, actually. But anyway, so the Chinese are going to turn their society over to, they're going to take people with high education, high status, high experience, and put them at the lowest possible juncture to teach them a lesson and create a new part of society. That's the logic of it. Now, these kids are called the Red Guards, and they walk around, of course, red is a symbol of communism. You see it in the Soviet Union, you see it in China, etc., etc., etc. And we publish the world's most printed book in history. Now, the Bible is probably the most copied book in history, but much of the Bible's copying for the first 1,500 years of its existence is done by hand. This is a book called Mao's Quotations. It is a series of about 300 sayings. If we we're in my classroom right now, I'd go to my shelf and I'd pull out my copy. It's about yay big. Here is my uh, fire stick remote. It's about that size. All right. And you, it was small because that way you could carry it with you. And you were expected you'd have a copy with you. So if you ever needed some inspiration, you needed to like just, gosh, I don't know, just feel something about Mao, you would just pull out your book and get inspiration. And so we're going to use it as propaganda. Everybody had to have a copy. So there's millions and millions and millions of copies. I'm going to show you here in this PowerPoint on my laptop that's open, an example of some propaganda. There is a poster of Mao, and you see everyone holding up their red book. My personal favorite is this one. This is of three factory workers taking a break from their labors. And instead of, you know, relaxing or something, what are they going to do? They're going to look at Mao's little red book for inspiration. And man, they're super excited. You can definitely tell that. So that's where we are, as Mao is going to be our great inspiration for the revolution. His sayings, his wisdom, gosh, he's just so darn smart. Except the Cultural Revolution doesn't really work that much either. All right. And so we do see some changes, though. 
um, the United States decides that we want to open up a relationship with China. Obviously, the Cold War, as soon as China becomes communist in 1949, we shut down our relationship with them. In fact, the United Nations Security Council is that spot is not taken by China for 23 years. It is taken by Taiwan. Whenever the nationalists lost the Civil War to end um, in 1949, the leader of China at that time, Chiang Kai-shek, he takes the National Treasury of China, in other words, their national bank's money, and heads to Taiwan with his closest followers. And that's where they've been hanging out ever since. And so we give the seat in the United Nations Security Council not to billion people mainland China because they're communists, they're bad. So we give that seat to tiny small island Taiwan. And that is the case until President Nixon of the United States decides to make nice. And true story, the first cracks in that relationship where we start to become friends again happen with Chinese and American ping pong players when the American ping pong team does a tour of China in the early 1970s. So um, at this point, Mao is very old, he's getting frail, but he decides making a friendship with the United States would be a positive thing for him. And that is where we kind of get to. Um, just a reminder of how long Chinese history is, American press follow President Nixon when he visits China in 1972. And one of the press asked the Chinese, basically, vice president, a guy named Zhou Enlai. They say, Mr. Zhou, has the French Revolution been any influence on your culture and your revolution? Now, this is 1972. The French Revolution started in 1789, so we're looking at 180 years earlier. Mr. Joe says it's too soon to tell. China has 5,000 years of history. 180 years is not enough time to analyze anything effectively. So, as Mao is getting older, he is getting frail, he's getting weak. And he dies in 1976. And like other dictatorships, there's no clear successor. There's going to be a fight to get there. And the guy who's going to replace Mao Zedong is named Deng Xiaoping. Yes, his name is Deng. Make all the jokes you want. That's fine. Deng is going to be the leader of China from 1978 to 1992. And Deng has an interesting philosophy. He looks at China and says, we stink. Our economy sucks. We're not industrialized. If you had asked... A Chinese scholar in 1978, the year of my birth. What is the future of China in 40 years? They would have said, crap. China had shown no indication outside of some small industrial steps that they would be a powerful nation in the world. None in 100 years, almost 150 years. But they have an economic miracle, and it's for a very simple reason. China continues its dictatorship. It is still a dictatorship right now. But China decides to liberalize their economy. Now, they're not a capitalist society full-fledged. They have what we would call a mixed economy. We sell off some government-owned businesses. The big stuff, your airports, your railroads, your steel production, that is still under the government. But they allow private business, which allows people to make money and improve their profit. And so we see the economy of China skyrocket over the last four decades. Massive, massive economic growth, improved economic opportunity, over and over and over and over again. So this is something that we see in China. Their economy has blossomed. They have massively reduced the amount of poverty in the world. Um, hundreds of millions of Chinese people are now in what we would, out of poverty in, in many cases, what we would call the middle class. So that has been taking place. China has a stock market. A couple of Chinese companies you may know, Hire, H-A-I-E-R, makes a... Uh, Oh, shoot. Um, old man brain fart. <clears throat> they make appliances, including a lot of refrigerators, especially the little refrigerators you would have in your college dorm. You also have Lenovo, which is a laptop company. They make computers. They're Chinese. So their economy is booming. They have a lot of natural resources. And so today they're one of the world's great economic centers, especially because of manufacturing. As I'm sure many of you know, many of the items we make or we have in our possession are manufactured in China. And that has been the case now for a couple decades. A couple of things associated with that. And by the way, Deng's quote about this, uh, this system is, he says, it doesn't matter if a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. In other words, if you have a cat because you want them to kill mice, you don't care what color the cat is. That's not the purpose of the cat is its appearance, it's its effectiveness. So who cares what we call the economy? Who cares what ideology we follow? The purpose of an economy is to allow people to have the means to support themselves and have a good lifestyle. And that has not been in the case in China for a long, long time. So we basically adopt capitalist principles, and it has made the Chinese economy massively improve. 
Now, a couple other things about China to show that they're a dictatorship. We're concerned about population growth. One of the things that we believe might stymie our economic growth is having way too many people. So we will enact what is called the one child policy. All right. And if you are a Chinese ethnic person, you're they're the Han Chinese, as we call them, you are restricted and you live in a city, you are restricted to one child per family. Uh, it depends on which town you live in, which city you live in. Uh, in many cases, you're not forced to give up a second child. You can have a second kid, but then you might lose your apartment because your landlord is the Chinese government. You might lose your job because your boss in many cases will be the Chinese government. So there are ways to get you to, um, to change and do what they want you to do. So um, anyway, that's, that's a, an impact that will lower their population growth, but causes some unintended consequences. Because we often don't have things like nursing homes in traditional Chinese society, if your parents are elderly, you will take care of them. And because it's also patriarchal, we will take care of the husband's parents before we'll take care of the wife's. So if you had only one child you could have, you wanted to have a boy because he'd make more money, bring more honor to your family probably, and potentially take care of you priority-wise if you're old. So we end up with a, a higher percentage of males born than females for about 30 years. That was not an intended consequence, but certainly an important one. And so um, it is quite possible that, you know, it's, it's basically gonna have a, a, an imbalance. The numbers are hard to replicate, but we do have a, a Chinese phrase called broken branches, which are young men who want to get married and literally cannot find a wife because there is um, shortages of females for them to marry. If you look at anyone you know who may have adopted someone from China in the United States, they're a girl. They're a girl because you would never give up a boy for adoption. It's just not something that happened in that time. Uh, in China for the most part. As of October 2015, they lessened that policy. Now it's two children are encouraged. It's not enforced as stringently, but the it has worked in slowing population growth, but it's had some other negative uh, unintended consequences, such as we're getting a generation of people retiring who are way bigger than the people below them a generation who are going to have to support them financially. And it's basically an inverted pyramid, and that's a hard thing to make work. All right, a couple of the things about China showing their dictatorship. We have what's called Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen Square is the world's largest public space. You can fit up to a million people in it. There's the poster in my classroom of a man standing in front of a line of tanks. That's from the Tiananmen Square protest in 1989. 1989, as we'll discuss in a future lecture, is the year that we see the ending of communism in Europe start to happen. It's also a year that there's different protests in China. Students are frustrated, etc. Um, it's a lot of young people, and then it will spread out to other parts of society. They occupy Tiananmen Square, which is in front of the um, Forbidden City. That is the Ming Dynasty era palace where the emperors lived and their concubines and families. It's called the Forbidden City because no non-noble could ever, or, or um, royal could ever go inside of there. So it's almost a museum at this point, but it's a symbol of traditional Chinese power. And so it's also in the public square where Mao Zedong's body is uh, celebrated in, a, in a, his uh, mausoleum there. So it's a symbol of Chinese authority. And so young people occupy it. Art students will build a mini replica of the Statue of Liberty. So you can see where their influence is coming from. And they would like to see freedom in China. For a while, they even allow some of these students on television. They debate communist, they de uh, debate communist Party leaders and discuss why we should have more rights for young people like they're starting to see in Europe. And this is tolerated for a while, a couple months. And then it's decided in June of 1989, we're going to bring in the tanks and we're going to end this and we're going to punish those who have revolted. We do not have place for this. And this is the famous photograph I have at my classroom in black and white. This is the color version of one man stopping a line of tanks. Um, he is pulled into that first tank by um, the guy in that tank. And you see that first tank starting to open the hatch. And the guy comes out and gets him. We assume he goes to jail. We don't really know exactly what does happen to him. Now, the square is cleared. The people that are protesting are pushed out. Many of them had already left when there's threats of this. But uh, the government says that only a few dozen were killed. Uh, it's thousands, actually, probably was the number of people that are killed. And so it shows that in spite of the fact that the Chinese have liberalized their economy, they absolutely are a dictatorship. 
And so when we get when we think about China today, we think of their economic miracle, their growth in, in manufacturing, how they're one of the world's richest nations, and then we also think that they are still a dictatorship. So as we will see when we look at the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union, when they, they became Russia, tried to become a capitalism and democracy at the same time. It was too much. The system couldn't handle it. The Soviets, oh, excuse me, the Chinese will keep their dicta dictatorship, but they will try to become a capitalist society, and that has worked fantastically well for them. So that is the story of China in time period four. Thanks.